Okay, hello, my name is Suzanne Paulson. I'm the CEO and the founder of IECO, and I again thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're really excited about the presentations that you're going to be seeing. Um, the a couple of things just to, in, as, as kind of housekeeping. Um, it, I'm sure all of us are very practiced in the Zoom world now. First, I want to say I hope everybody's very safe and, and healthy right now. Um, the chat, because we have so many people uh, attending tonight, we've cut off, uh, the, the chat has been disabled. So if you have any questions throughout these presentations, please put them in the Q&A section versus the chat section. And at the end of the presentations, we'll address as many of the questions as we can. Um, with that, we're gonna get going now. I'm incredibly proud and delighted to uh, introduce two extraordinary doctors that are very, very dedicated to serving the dry eye patients and the dry eye community. First, Dr. Leslie O'Dell. Dr. Leslie O'Dell has spent many years, decades, um, really focusing on the area of ocular surface diseases with glaucoma, but also in the area of dry eye, obviously, um, and has also been honored to be one of uh, six of the global ambassadors for TFOS. She was involved in the dues too. Um, she has written uh, many articles on the topics of, of various topics of dry eye, so we're excited to have her here. In addition, she's also the chief clinical investigator in the study that she's going to be presenting tonight with uh, preliminary findings. After she presents her preliminary findings, you're going to have a wonderful presentation from Dr. Bruce Dorn. Dr. Bruce Dorn joins us from Winnipeg, Canada. And he too has spent and dedicated his life to dry eye patients. He spent the last decade developing one of the leading practices in Canada um, for serving dry eye patients. And in addition to that, he also does a lot of lecturing on the topic and is well known in his markets. And we're proud to have him here because he's one of those um, doctors like many of you in attendance, I'm sure because you're here and you're taking the time to learn more that are all about learning, but then making whatever you learn happen in practice and, and, and bringing to this um, presentation real practical ways to implement um, protocols that serve both at first and foremost the patient and the patient care, but then also really help to drive the practice um, forward, especially during these times. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. O'Dell. Um, I think that is about it, and I'm going to go away, and I'll join you at the end. Um, thank you again for joining us. Dr. Odell? Well, thank you, Suzanne, um, and thank you to everybody who um, decided to take a little bit of time this evening to join us. Um, I know we've been busy getting back into clinic and things, and so it's just nice to have you. I see a lot of um, colleagues that have registered, and I really appreciate um, you coming to learn um, a little bit about what um, I have been up to, and always grateful for um, Suzanne and IECO for really helping to fuel the um, interest I have in research. So I've been in private practice settings between up ophthalmology and actually, you know, private optometry and I always seem to have the desire to do research. And so I'm always kind of been seeking it myself. And in private practice, you don't really get that many opportunities, but she's been um, gracious with um, allowing me to, you know, kind of put some of my ideas into motion and I get, I get to share them with you all this evening. So we're going to talk a little bit about how at-home therapies um, can really help our in-office treatments when it comes to meibomian gland dis um, dysfunction. And actually, I'm going to go over two different studies that I was able to do, um, a pilot study that is utilizing um, heat at home in addition to in-office treatments with Libiflow, and then also um, heat and vibration technology, which is really exciting. And I know why a lot of you are here tonight is to learn more about that. So we all know, you know, we're becoming very well versed, I would say, in meibomian gland dysfunction. If you look at the meibomian gland um, workshop from 2011, it's defined as a chronic diffuse abnormality of the meibomian glands, and that's often characterized by terminal duct obstruction. We see that on our exams, right? We can see the glands not producing clear, healthy mybum, and we see both that qualitative and quantitative change to the secretion. And with that and the thinning of the lipid layer, we start to see this alteration of the tear film, and that lends to symptoms that patients will have with eye irritation, um, and then what we can see clinically with inflammation, and then ultimately ocular surface disease and, and dry eye that we're we're all seeing. If you look at 
TFAS dues too and um, dues original, we have these levels of dry eye disease and these levels kind of help guide our treatment. But what is interesting is that no matter what level you are, if you're at the mildest level or you're at the most severe level, meibomian gland dysfunction is present you know, at all levels. Now, in the more severe cases, you can see a lot of um, truncation or atrophy of the glands, but, you know, really it, it just goes to show that we should be evaluating meibomian glands for all our patients. Some other research that I think is, you know, pertinent to share now during J July, which is Dry Eye Awareness Month, and then also has the Sjogren's um, Awareness Day as well, is that there is a big correlation between meibomian gland dysfunction for our Sjogren's patients. So it's not just aqueous deficiency, um, you know, as we once kind of thought. And, and really just making sure that your exam is not only looking for the obvious signs that might be lid margin changes or telangiectasia or, you know, visibly capped glands, but also that your ex exam is looking for the non-obvious meibomian gland dysfunction. And with that, it really comes down to expression, right? So if you're not pressing on the glands to actually do an evaluation of the quality of that meibum, you don't really know what's living inside the glands. Um, I would encourage you to look at the MGE, which is um, a standardized pressure that is placed on the meibomian glands so it is reproducible between um, providers and even yourself as you go and treat the glands and then reassess the glands. So what we're doing when we're diagnosing meibomian gland dysfunction is just, you know, what I was touching on, which is looking at function and structure. Um, I actually started my training um, residency trained at the Baltimore VA hospital um, with a strong background in glaucoma and always kind of surprised myself that I ended up with this passion for dry eye because, you know, a lot of times if you're at the back of the eye, you're not at the front of the eye and vice versa. But I, I really feel like a lot of what I learned in my residency with structure and function of the optic nerve and how that, you know, relates to things like the visual field and the, um, OCT analysis really has helped me um, develop my interest in meibomian gland dysfunction and utilize that thinking. So um, I look at that a, a lot the same way as far as function and um, structure. So structure is visible to you if you're utilizing transillumination, sometimes visible to you even with white light and just lowering the eyelid. Um, I've seen some really great pictures where you can see truncation of the glands that way. But ultimately, Ultimately, my biography is where you're going to learn a lot about the glands and also be able to better educate patients. Some other research that I um, was able to do independent of IECO um, that was presented at ARVO this year really looked at um, inner observer um, grading for my biography, whether it was atrophy using a standardized scale, tortuosity, um, or segmentation, like a splitting of the glands. Um, and this was done with leading experts across the country. And we really had trouble um, agreeing on all of those screenings. And then what we did was we um, had a short education series that was all done digitally. And then they retested themselves. And we did see a an improvement in agreement between observers. So I think that with my biography, we all have a lot to learn. Um, and, you know, I'm hopeful that we will develop more of those resources as we move forward. With this, though, we have to really look at how things have shifted over the past 20 years. Again, moving from something that was thought to be solely aqueous deficient into, you know, a predominantly evaporative disease state now with my bomy and gland dysfunction taking the lead. Taking that into account with everything that we're learning, you know, during this period of time as well, digital device use, lifestyle, um, whether it is that digital device use and incomplete blinks or um, less blinks throughout the day, things like cosmetics, things like preservatives that are close to the eye, um, also just environment, you know, humidity levels, all of those things, these glands are very delicate um, and you only get one set. So we have to do all we can to protect them and stay really proactive in how we treat meibomian gland dysfunction instead of, you know, waiting for the patient to present with symptoms, you know. So I would challenge you all just to make sure that you're treating every patient in your chair like they could have meibomian gland dysfunction until you prove to yourself that they don't. 
So, so the first study um, that I am going to go over was um, done with patients that I was treating with Lipiflow. So everyone had gotten a Lipiflow treatment in the office. I had seven patients ranging in age from 41 to 81, um, a little bit heavier on the females, so two, five female to two, to two males. And then everybody went home with the XL, the Tranquilize XL mask, and I asked them to do that for 20 minutes at home. And really the thought behind this was, um, I have been using Lipiflow thermal pulsation since it's um, since it really began in tw in 2012 um, in Pennsylvania. We were the first center to have access to thermal pulsation. Um, and I remember, you know, early in, I would see patients back at a month, and then I was seeing them back at two months instead, and then sometimes I was even waiting three months because it seemed like the glands were taking a little bit of time to start to show changes with the expression. So my thought with pairing um, a um, prolonged moist heat at home with the Tranquilize XL was could I get um, better results, symptoms, and signs quicker? And so I wanted to see them back sooner than my typical. So like I said, typically I'm seeing a Lipiflow patient back at about eight weeks. And then sometimes I do need to add on another post-treatment exam. But these patients, I was trying to get them back as close to a, a month as I could. Why I thought that this might be beneficial is because of all the research that has come, you know, really a lot of it comes from Dr. Korb and Dr. Blackie, who've taught us so much about meibomian gland function. But if you look at meibomian gland disease, we know we have, we have a solidification problem, right? So the oil and the meibum is becoming more of a solid than a liquid. And actually, and as that's happening, also the melting point is changing. So as you're developing these obstructive meibomian gland dysfunctions, you are seeing an increase in the melting temperature. So that means that maybe a mask that would help a mild patient might not help your moderate to severe patient. And that melting time really does matter. So how long you have the heat near the glands is, is a big deal. If you look again at the MGD workshop from 2011, we kind of started to learn about the liquefaction process with MIBUM and these numbers that we're all starting to get very familiar with seeing were kind of born in the literature, which is if you're heating, you really want to try to achieve this um, 40 degrees Celsius on the outside in order to try to make a difference um, on liquefaction on the inner side. Um, and that's and that's really how Tier Science at the time and now Johnson & Johnson um, developed it. And, and ultimately, Dr. Korb developed the science around Lipiflow. Um, they are 42 degrees continuous heat on the inner surface of the, of the lids. Again, this melting temperature, if you look at it in normal individuals, you can see thinning of the mybum at um, a lower temperature than you do in your MGD patients. So um, this is what really matters too. And then also grading the severity, um, you know you're going to need more heat um, for longer periods of time. And although, you know, we have some really great masks available that are microwavable, you know, they kind of time out at six to 10 minutes and research is really showing us that in these moderate to advanced cases, 15 um, or more minutes is essential. Hi, hey, Dr. Odell, if I could just ask you a question here. Um, one thing that I've just noticed in my practice anecdotally is, you know, when we're seeing patients go home and they're doing a series of these, these hot compresses, the moist, you know, 20 minute moist heat compress really seems to improve both the quality and the quantity of expression. Have you, have you seen that in some of your research? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also, so the, the more that they're using it and you're exposing it to the heat, it really helps to thin the oil, um, which kind of shows, um, you know, in why we sometimes need to be doing repeat treatments on patients that have very obstructive disease. So I definitely see that as well. If you look at some of the research um, that um, Dr. Blackie did, if you're trying to make a big impact, you know, on the glands and get that inner lid temperature elevated, um, you can see that in an MGD patient, you need to be at that 40 degrees Celsius for about 20 minutes to get that um, 
that thinning. And that's really what sets, um, you know, the product line that, that Tranquil Vibes and Tranquil um, Eyes has is that they have moist heat that is sustainable for 20 minutes. And that's why I chose to do that um, in particular in the study. Is there anything more you wanted to add um, here, Dr. Dorn? Okay, if not, but. No, that's good. That's, that's exactly what we've seen just over, you know, doing this for years. We've just noticed, you know, we kind of started off with, you know, recommending 10 minutes, but we found that when we started having people doing it for 20 minutes, which they found, you know, the, the hot compressing to be very comfortable and relaxing at home, um, it worked a lot better when we were seeing people back for subsequent expressions. Yeah. Um, so also that moist heat is important because if you think about, um, you know, the way that if, if you were boiling water on a, um, on a stove top and you have that moist heat, you stick your hand in that, it's going to really burn. But if you stuck your hand into the dry oven um, that was at the same temperature, you know, that heat is different. So moist heat also dissipates into the lid um, to help liquefy the mybum. Um, in a more efficient way than just a dry heat. So with some of the masks that are now, you know, USB plug-in, the downside of some of those is really just that they don't provide that moist heat um, that we know is essential. Yeah, Dr. Odell, we, we did notice that too in our clinic. We, we were trying some other masks in the past and, and they were strictly dry heat. And actually some people felt it was actually kind of painful. And so we had some dropout of our patients where they just wouldn't comply with the home compressing. So um, the moist heat was really something that it was a game changer for us, for sure. Hmm. They felt like it just was getting too warm, I guess. Yeah. Or I guess it just is a different sensation on the skin. Yeah, they, they felt it was actually quite uncomfortable to do it that way. So, you know, plus at home, you've got these microwavable, some of these kits are, you know, you can't control that. What the patient's doing at home, they might be overheating it or underheating it, and they're just not getting that reproducible compress. Mm-hmm. Um, that is definitely interesting. Um, I have not that much exposure to the ones that are the USB, um, except for my own personal use. So that's good to get some patient feedback for sure. Um, so temperature matters, but also again, the duration matters. So we know uh, that we want to be at 40 degrees Celsius, but then some of the work again from Caroline Blackie showed that if you were trying to thin the mybum, that 15 to 20 minutes was needed, you know, at times, especially when you had obstructive disease. So with warm compresses, we want to heat the glands to facilitate the secretion to the tear film. Um, we want to try to alleviate that obstruction. Um, and I like actually what Dr. Doran's going to talk to is how he does things in his clinic um, in a little bit, because he really um, sets the stage for helping to alleviate the obstruction prior to what he does in the office, you know, with at home beginning, you know, before a procedure, which is, you know, really smart when you're trying to thin the obstruction. And then also you're increasing blood flow to the glands through the warm, moist heat, and that can also help the functionality of the glands perform better. What I saw in the patients that I treated this way with the Lipiflow um, and the masks, um, so again, they, they had Lipiflow done in the office, and then they were sent home with Tranquilize XL, 20 minutes a day, at home heat, kept a log. Um, when they came back with symptoms, and I was using two different surveys, I was using both the Speed and the DEQ5. And so we saw um, over 50% improvement of symptoms at a month post-treatment um, in both um, for all of those patients. And then the tear breakup time was significantly better. So 62% improvement in tear breakup time and the glands were performing beautifully, almost 300% improvement with um, mybomian glands yielding liquid secretion. And I'll just touch on that a little bit. I know many of you know what this means, but for you, those of you who are not familiar, um, one of the ways to grade when you're doing research um, and I, I'm thankful that I was able to be involved in some research um, in the tier science days um, with protocols that were written by Dr. Korb because it really taught me a lot about even what I was doing wrong with instilling vital dyes um, and such. But mybomian glands yielding liquid secretions using the mybomian gland evaluator, um, which is applying the pressure of a blink, so a standardized pressure. When you do that, you put it, um, I usually start temporally, and I'm looking at five glands 
five glands centrally and then five glands nasally. And you're just counting the number of glands in those five glands, um, so 15 total, that are secreting oil um, like olive oil. So you just count, you know, whatever it is, if it's two out of five that, or two out of 15, that would mean two of the 15 glands had olive oil like secretions. Um, so lipoflow combined with at home heat significantly impacted the number of glands that were yielding that liquid secretion. So, you know, just goes to show the patients are investing a lot in their money or in their eyes when they're electing these treatments in our offices and just pairing them with at home um, solutions like an XL or, um, you know, even the iCloud mask that um, iEco has can really help accelerate symptom improvement, clinical sign improvement, and hopefully, you know, maintain what we're doing with our in-office treatments. So the second study that we started and is still ongoing. So my section um, as the clinical investigator um, is complete. And then I think that we have two or three other sites that are still in the data collection. Um, but really the preliminary findings were so excited, we so exciting we couldn't wait to share them. So um, that is what we're doing here. Also, I just want to tell you that we're two minutes past, but apparently 8 20 2020 it was a big deal tonight, but I'm, I'm not sure what the eight part was. <laughs> so anyway, I saw someone post about that um, and thought, oh, well, we'll be on the phone when that's happening. So what I did with this class was um, utilize some really new, exciting te um, technology from iEco called Tranquil Vibes. And so that is really the science and the heat and the moist component of Tranquilize XL combined with a vibration of 180 millihertz. And so that is, in, if you're familiar, and I have some photos to show you, but it's inside the band of, her, of, of the mask. And so it's um, plugged in via a USB and is vibrating at that 180 millihertz um, for the whole treatment until you unplug. So that goes even beyond the, the cool down phase. Um, what we looked at with this study and what we're looking at with this study are, again, is signs and symptoms. So for signs, I, um, I always just try to have more than one questionnaire when I'm doing um, research. So we have um, speed and the DEQ5. We are looking at things with mybography, lipid layer thickness. Um, we're doing, again, the meibomian gland evaluation, counting the number of glands yielding clear secretions. We collected data on um, visual acuities tear breakup time, which was fluorescein tear breakup time, um, corneal staining, and then um, expressibility. So, so far, um, let me just see. So, so what the protocol really was showing um, or set up to do was the patient was going to have a 20 minute in office moist heat treatment with the Tranquil Vibes mask. So I would set them up in the exam lane for 20 minutes. They would sit with the Tranquil Vibes mask on. Um, and then I actually did a manual gland expression in the office. That was their first gland expression. And then they got sent home um, with either the XL mask or the Tranquil Vibes. And they were instructed to continue 20 minutes a day um, of at-home daily moist heat and then they returned in a month. Now, I didn't know what mask they were given, and it was totally blind um, to me and is blind to the other um, investigators ongoing right now. So this is, um, if you look at this, you can see the Tranquilize XL on your right and the Tranquil Vibes on your left. And so both of them are amazing signs when it comes to heat. So again, giving us this 20 minutes controlled moist heat ranging um, in that sweet spot, 102 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and has a lot of humidity and moisture, which is, again, what helps that heat to kind of radiate, um, get absorbed into the tissues, and really help to thin the mybum. In the vibes, we have the vibration. And so if you look the way that this mask is kind of turned over, this gray ring is this vibration ring. Um, and it surrounds both of the oculars. And then this is the USB that, um, you know, plugs in. Uh, they can actually listen to headphones as well and just sort of relax. I mean, it, it really is like a spa treatment um, and patients love that part. Um, I was a little bit, you know, for the ones that got the vibration mask at home, they, they definitely lucked out on this study. Um, 
and then if you're familiar at all with the Tranquilize XL, both of these use these um, instants. And so what's nice about them, although, you know, there are microwavable versions of this too, sometimes with a mask, well, first of all, a mask um, that's microwavable, again, is only giving us six to 10 minutes. So it good for mild, but not ideal for moderate to advanced MGD. Um, but a lot of times patients will sometimes become non-compliant to those microwavable masks because they're doing it before bed, they're in their bedroom, the microwave's downstairs, and they're, you know, human, and so they're a little bit lazy at times. Um, what's nice about the XL um, and the Vibes mask is that the instants are just that you just click a little disc that's inside, it sparks a chemical reaction, and the discs are instantly warm and stay warm. And then they're reset through boiling for about five minutes. So they're reusable um, and patients really like it. Again, the moisture um, that is provided is, is fantastic. So my study, um, actually I had 10 patients, but you know, like any good research project, um, I was doing the one month follow up, and the lady was like, I have breast cancer and have been on all these medicines, and I forgot to tell you that at the beginning. So, we obviously took her out, um, which left me with nine patients for my section. Um, and they had an average age of about 60 years old. Um, I think all my patients actually were female in this group. Um, four of them ended up with the vibration mask with Tranquil Vibes, and five of them had the Tranquilize XL. And remember, they both, all, all of these patients had the manual gland expression in my office, went home with the masks, and were um, asked to do 20 minutes of heat therapy a day. Um, and then we saw them back in a month. So I'm just going to show you um, my, my part of this, which again had an overwhelmingly positive um, impact on symptoms. So both groups, Tranquilize is gonna be on your right and Tranquil Vibes is gonna be on your left. Both groups, amazing improvement. Um, almost 60% of the Vibes group had improvement of their symptoms based on speed. Um, actually 57% had symptom improvement based on the DEQ5 in that group, um, but both groups improved. Um, tear breakup time was really improved. Um, and we even had it broken out between right and left eye. So if you look at that left eye, um, improved as much as um, 68% um, for my vibes group. Um, and, but again, improved in the XL group as well. And then all, SPK wasn't that significant in these groups from what I remember, but I still had significant clearing of SPK just through um, helping to thin that my bum and stabilize the tear film better. So 80 to um, 50 to 80% improvement of SPK um, from those in the study. For you, um, for any of you that are unfamiliar with DEQ5, part of the reason why I chose DEQ5 in addition to speed is um, when you're looking to make the diagnosis of dry eye disease based on TFOS DUS2, you, you need to have symptoms and clinical signs. And symptoms were based on um, validated questionnaires, and the DEQ5 was kind of called out in that document, um, as was OSDI. Now, things like Speed or Sandy or other validated questionnaires were also mentioned, so it's not that you can't utilize those, um, but still I'm finding a fair amount of doctors, you know, are kind of resistant to questionnaires. This one's nice because it is fast, you know, five questions, easy for the patient to understand. I also like it because Again, you know, with Sjogren's awareness um, on the rise um, right now, you know, during Dry Eye Awareness Month, um, this questionnaire, if you would score 12 or higher as you add up your columns, um, there is a stronger correlation to Sjogren's. So, you know, I think sometimes we fall into the habit of treating dry eye disease right here. And we forget around about the rest of the of the rest of the person. So, you know, this is sort of a prompt for me when I see a high number on a DEQ5 to kind of step back and ask my typical questions that I, you know, think about when I'm thinking about Sjogren's, which are dry mouth, can you eat a saltine without drinking water, um, chronic cough, um, fatigue, muscle aches. Um, those are big ones um, that I, you know, tend to ask patients. Um, you know, really, and to make me see if I want to do um, lab work for them. So just like I said, I wanted to show you what the DEQ5 looked like. It's looking at um, 
eye discomfort and how often people are feeling that way, how intense the discomfort is, and then also um, how bad it is right before they go to bed, which, you know, kind of is, you know, lends toward MGD, although, you know, a lot of research shows that this is a good for aqueous deficient, but obviously in our MGD patients, because of rapid tear breakup over the course of a day, they're going to have more discomfort oftentimes at the end of the day. What was interesting when we did the breakout on this DEQ5, and that's why I wanted to kind of dip into that, is that in both groups, um, our VIBES group and the XL group, we saw that the intensity of eye discomfort, so how intense the person described the discomfort, um, improved in both groups. And so that would be um, this question here. When your eyes felt discomfort, how intense was the feeling of discomfort? You know, all the way from never to very intense. So to make a big improvement there um, with both of these masks is, is a win for me because, you know, that intensity of dry eye um, dips into the chronic, you know, condition that we know it is and then also kind of fuels things like anxiety around dry eye disease and um, depression because they can't perform tasks like they once did. So I feel like this stands out that we can really impact quality of life, which is obviously, you know, what we're trying to do. Um, what also stood out was that if you look at just the intensity of eye dryness, the vibes mask, so the tranquil vibes mask seem to have a bigger impact of that sp symptom specifically, so of intensity of eye dryness. So again, if you combine the two things, intensity of eye discomfort and how that patient is perceiving eye dryness, the vibes mask is providing a lot of relief that can then translate um, hopefully into better quality of life. What I was able to conclude from my work thus far was that both types of controlled moist heat significantly improve the symptoms of dry eye um, when it relates to MGD. Um, and they were both similar with their um, objective outcomes, meaning like what I was seeing with my Bomian gland um, secretions. So um, I would definitely encourage you to look into Tranquil Vibes. It's an exciting new technology. It's really broadening what we can do at home. And I feel like, you know, especially now we're doing more from home. Um, so something you can definitely parlay into your, your clinics. Um, we also thank you very much for the preliminary um, questions that we asked um, as you were registering for tonight's webinar. Um, it kind of shed some light on just what our colleagues are doing across the um, the country, and I think that even a little bit international. I think I saw some doctors I know from out of the country um, tuning in tonight, so thanks again. Um, but what you'll see in this group, and so, you know, really not surprising because we have a lot of great dry eye doctors on the, on the call tonight, but the majority responded that they're screening patients for dry eye disease yeah, 76 to 100 percent of the time. So, or yeah, 76 to 100% of the time. So kudos to you guys. And I would say, keep it up for everybody else, especially this, um, you know, 11 to 25% that you're screening and, and the, the bottom half of our statistics, I guess you will. I would really say, look at every dry, every patient encounter, like I said earlier, as a dry eye patient until proven otherwise. So, and especially when it comes to MGD. Um, what we're learning about digital device use is that that needle on age just continues to move downward. What we're seeing with youth, you know, um, staring here, staring at the screen, doing their learning digitally, and that is increasing more than ever. Um, gaming for leisure, you know, we're seeing a lot of impact in um, my bony and gland dysfunction younger and younger. And also, um, you know, lid seal. So inadequate lid closure at night is a big evaporative stress. Um, and I really learned that through my own child. My son, every time I check him at night, he's got an eye open. Um, and I've been trying to work with Suzanne to give him some kind of superhero mask that I can get him interested in wearing to sleep because on his mybography, he's already starting to show some changes. I think we're also doing a, a pretty good job um, with questionnaires, um, although the majority still responded that they weren't. So I would encourage you to also, you know, it's quick, it's easy. You can even have patients now fill that out ahead of even showing up in your office. Um, Dr. Dorn and I were speaking a little bit 
ahead of tonight's call about what we utilize. Um, like, I, like I said, through the research, you know, predominantly I would say on a day-to-day basis, I'm, I'm using speed. Um, what's nice about it is it's great to screen for everybody, um, but it's also validated. So I use that at every dry eye patient encounter. And it really provides a lot of information to me about you know, where I'm headed with that patient treatment or if something could be going on that maybe would actually have flared them up when I wasn't expecting it. And that's, you know, opened the door to new medications that, you know, could be possibly to blame, new habits that might be possibly to blame, Um, you know, so using them not just once, but then using them as your guide to kind of continue to track what your patients are feeling. Um, But Dr. Dorn, do you want to talk a little bit about what you do as far as screening patients um, in your practice? Uh, I think we do much the same. We're using both questionnaires. Um, I think it's nice to have that baseline because when you come back and talk to patients, they want to know that something, you know, are they improving? Is there a way to gauge? Are they improving? And this is a really simple way, you know, so we have a clipboard and it's got dry erase on it. So we had it laminated so patients can come in. We don't have to go through a lot of paper. They can just simply, right on this clipboard and then we can input the values into their file and we've got it there. So it's not like I have to spend that time, my staff do it ahead of time and it's already inputted. So I know kind of, kind of some of the the symptoms that they're having beforehand. So I think it's a really valuable tool. Yeah. And did you think that, I think some of the, um, some of the hesitation um, that I have heard when people aren't utilizing questionnaires is around, um, you know, how your staff is going to handle things or the pushback that they presume the patient is going to have? Have you felt like it's been hard to implement in your practice? I think in the beginning, it was a little bit tough. But when we switched over and when we started using those clipboards again, what we did, it was I laminated one of the one of the uh, the questionnaires. The, you simply when the patient comes in, we give them a clipboard with a dry erase marker. They input their scores on there. They give it back to the staff. So there's very little the staff has to do other than input on on the patient file. And that makes it really easy for the staff because it's already done for them. Um, And it gives the doctor kind of a head start before. And then you can kind of question them a little bit more in depth on some of these symptoms. So I think it's it's been really easy since we started inputting that. And we're not, you know, in in this day and age, we're not going through so much paper. We can just do it a lot easier that way. Yeah, that, that is a good point. Um, the other thing that was nice to see is that we're all really paying a lot of attention to meibomian glands. So you can see that of the um, attendees that we polled, that um, almost 50% were doing some kind of manual gland expression. So that is super exciting. Um, you know, and I remember early on learning about um, MGD and, and treatments and such and how, um, you know, the tipping point is 10 years. And so 2021 would kind of mark that 10 year mark from um, um, the MGD workshop. And so it's exciting to see that science is really doing just that, you know, we're tipping into making this more mainstream. Um, Also interesting to see how many of us have adopted in-office um, treatments within our practices. So um, between Lipiflow and Ilux and now even um, tear care, I know some of um, the respondees were also having tear care, IPL, you know, it's good to see that. Um, but what Dr. Dorn is going to show you is even if you haven't yet invested in some of those technologies, you can be successful in starting the treatment of MGD um, in your practices through some of these, um, some of these uh, products. Other things that you are focusing really well on is your at-home care. So lid cleansers top the charts with things that you're recommending to your patients with um, MGD. Um, Moist compresses. Um, So I know that there's a lot of these um, base models, I guess I kind of call them for my mild patients, the microwavable masks. Um, But really what I've started to do over the past several years is really think about you know, the patient and the mask I'm recommending, much like I thought about the patient and the tier that I would recommend, um, you know, whether I was recommending a lipid tier or something like, um, you know, a fresh coat that might be helping an irregular cornea. So with the heat compresses, you want to be thinking about mild, moderate, severe, and one doesn't always treat the gamut. Um, A lot of uh, doctors also still supporting nutraceuticals, lots and lots of great research there with omega-3s and and that. Um, Night shields, um, some even doing the day shields. 
So with that, I'm going to let Dr. Doran kind of switch gears and get into the practical aspect of um, how you can implement um, Tranquil Vibes and Tranquil Excel in your practices. So take it away. Thanks a lot for your presentation, Dr. Odell. That was great. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, practical aspects of this, like how, you know, we started doing this in our office. And I think, you know, years ago when patients started coming into our office, they were, they were doing a lot of at-home treatments, you know, tea bags on the eyes. They were using a hot potato for compress. And so one thing that I've really liked is with IECO when we're using some of their products, it's always sterile and it's very reproducible. So, you know, we've all got all these dry eye patients. We've got a lot of MGD patients coming into our offices. So, you know, it's good to try to develop that practice because they're there and we want to show them that we can really solve these problems. So, you know, years ago I started to develop um, my dry eye practice and, you know, over the years we've tried a lot of different technologies. We have, you know, an Oculus K5M in the office. We do Blefx here. Um, we do inflammatory testing. We also do IPL. Um, but one of the things that I, I really enjoy doing is actually manual gland expressions because I think that kind of creates a connection between the treatment process between the patient and the doctor. You know, it's a very simple thing to start using. Um, all you have to do is really send the patient home. And I've always, you know, kind of wanted them to do some pretreatment before they come in for their manual expression. So um, I've got a little video that I'm going to show you in a few minutes to show how that's done. But I'll send the patient home with with the XL kit and they'll do a 20 minute moist heat compress for at least two weeks prior to their first treatment. So that way, when I'm doing that first expression, we're, we're trying to get the best type of result. Um, the thing to keep in mind is a lot of these patients, when I'm seeing them for the first time, are usually quite severe. The MGD is kind of at an advanced stage. So you've got to set the expectation for the patient so they know kind of what to expect. So I, I will always tell patients that, you know, we're going to do at least a series of three of these expressions that they'll come in um, after they've done their at-home treatments. We're going we're gonna to do an in-office treatment and I use the Tranquil Vibes because it combines the heat with the high-frequency vibration and I think that really helps right before you do a, a manual expression. That really helps the process. And I always describe to them, you know, the first time we do this, it might not be perfect. We're starting the process. It takes a while to get the glands functioning, but we're going to work at this. You know, the second time I see you, there's going to be some improvement and probably the weeks between the first and, and or the second and third treatment, you're going to start to feel some, you know, improvements yourself. And then after the third expression with most of my patients, they're really reporting a much improved tear film and, and they're starting to, to feel that things are improving. So, so really to get started with this, you know, you, you, you can simply send the patient home with their XL kit and then they start doing this. A lot of times I'll, I'll have them start with a, a tea tree foamer as well because I want to eliminate any possibility of Demodex and blepharitis. Um, they'll do the in-office treatment. And all you really need to do is invest in a, in a I would recommend some type of a forcep. Um, I prefer that over you know, trying to do a paddle and a Q-tip or, you know, doing something like that where it requires both hands. The four sets are, are really simple and they're, they're quite easy to use. So I'm just going to try to play this video. I hope this plays for everyone and they get good audio out of this. It just shows, I want to, you know, kind of emphasize the timeline, the amount of um, time and effort you have to put in the office is actually very short and you can introduce this in your flow very easily. Hi, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we do manual gland expressions in our office. It's a really simple thing to start up and, and basically what we do is we start off any of our MGD patients with a, a take-home XL kit. So this is from iEco. This is the one I typically use for at-home hot compressing. So I send them home, they, they go home and pre-treat for about two weeks. They're doing this hot compress 20 minutes a day for two weeks. I also, with blepharitis patients, I'll send them home with a, a tea tree foamer. We do want the lids to be as aseptic and clean as we can to start with. 
And then when the patient does come back to the office, in office, we, we also do a hot compress before we do our gland expression. And what we like to use is IECO has a Tranquil Vibes kit, which has heat and it vibrates. So I'm just gonna take you next door where we do our, uh, our pre-treatment. So we've got a patient in there right now. She's got a Tranquil Vibes on her eyes and she's been pre-treated for about 10 minutes. So Krisha, I'd like you to take that off now. How did that feel? That was okay? Yeah, that was really good. Great. I'll take this and I'll take that from you. And we can just go right next door to my office. Okay. Okay. So you can go right through there. Good. So the patient now is ready to have, you know, the simple expression done. So what I do is we always put one drop of anesthetic in. Not that the procedure, it isn't painful, and I let patients know it's not terribly uncomfortable. The nice thing is when, you're, when the doctor's doing it, you can kind of control the amount of pressure that you're using. Just have you look up. So I just put one drop in each eye. Okay, you can just wipe your eyes there a little bit, Krisha. So there's, there's many different expressing forceps on the market. They all seem to work quite well. I typically use a terse expressor, um, but there's, there's many that would work and really all you need to do is invest in a, in a simple forcep. So I'll just have you put your chin on there, forehead forward. So I typically tell patients that we'll, we'll do a series of gland expressions. So I'll say it usually takes about three expressions before we get kind of really good results. Okay, Christian, I'm just gonna have you look a little bit up. So, so now I've put, I put the anesthetic in, the patient's done her pretreatment. And so all I wanna do is make sure that, especially when I'm doing the first one, I'm gonna be fairly light on this. I use kind of one of my fingers to pull down her lower lid. And then the forceps just go between, between on the lid and I use gentle pressure. And I can kind of slowly increase the pressure to the point where I see expression of the meibomian glands starting to happen. So it's important to kind of see that there is a process. It starts off, you know, the first expression is a little bit limited. Is that okay? Did that feel all right? So you want to make sure the patient is comfortable. Each subsequent expression, you can use a little bit more pressure, a little bit more pressure. And I think a lot of times when we do expressions the first or second time even, you don't get a great expression, but don't be discouraged by that. It takes some time to you know, get the, uh, the mybum out of the tops of these glands, especially if they're really stenosed. So that's really all you need to do. You need to send the patient home with an at-home hot compress kit. You should have an in-office, something like a Tranquil Vibes where you can use heat and you know, high-frequency vibration, and you're gonna need to get yourself an expressor. All the dry eye patients are there. You just need to start doing that with your, with your uh, MGD patients. Okay, thanks a lot for watching. So in that video, I hope everyone gets kind of some idea of, of how you know, simple that is. That doesn't take uh, too much effort. You can easily fit that into the flow of the day. So I don't have a special day set aside where I just do expressions or anything like that. Um, the patients are already set up for me ahead of time. My staff has them do the tranquil vibes. What's interesting is, you know, we've had a number of patients that they've gone home with their, their XL kits and they've been doing their at-home treatments. I've seen them for a few expressions and a lot of them will then opt, they'll ask me if they can actually purchase the Tranquil Vibes and they'll, they'll move to that later on. And, and I think that's a really interesting thing. They, they, they're so compliant that they, they wanna move to a better form of that compressing that they see they have in our office. You know, so that's, that's been really good for um, you know, compliance and building our, you know, up our business and our dry eye practice. You know, we've had, we've done a calculation for the, in the year 2019, we had about 83% compliance with people coming back and doing those three, you know, subsequent expressions. So I think that's, that kind of speaks to, you know, patients feeling that there's a value in this. And, and it also, it puts a little bit more back in the doctor's hands. Um, I get to see how that mybum is changing over the, the duration of that treatment. 
Um, I get to control how much pressure is there. And, and, you know, I have that kind of constant contact with the patient. So if there's, if there's something missing, if I want to add in an omega-3, if I want to use some medical treatment, I can add that in, you know, during one of their, their follow-up expressions. So I think it's, it's really important because that gives me that constant contact with a, with a patient who's got a very chronic disease that's not going to go away quickly. So, you know, we've got a little breakdown here and I just, I just want to kind of show viewers kind of what we do as far as, you know, how we financially, how we can kind of improve our practices and make our, our, our practices a little bit more financially healthy. You know, you can see that I'm charging, you know, usually about $50 per um, sitting and, you know, you can, you can decide for yourself, you know, what you want to charge for that service. But I think that makes it extremely cost effective for patients as opposed to somebody that potentially does, um, you know, a lipoflow procedure, and let's say it didn't go well, they've, they've paid a lot of money, and now they're very disappointed, and that patient is somebody that you may lose from your, your practice. So, you know, I think that's something that I, I really want to emphasize that, that, you know, you, you really maintain compliance, and you have that constant contact with your dry eye patient. So mm -hmm. I want to thank, I want to thank Dr. Odell for her presentation. I want to thank uh, Suzanne Paulson for inviting me on. Hello. I'm back. Thank you both very much. We do have, um, there's been a lot of questions, which is great. So I was going to address um, as many as I can right now. We have eight minutes left. Um, and thank you both for all that really valuable uh, information. Um, one of the, the first ones we have is that there was um, a lot of people were asking about some it, the effectiveness of manual gland expression. I think you've covered it a lot, but people will get a little bit um, frustrated. Doctors will they they don't see anything on the first run. Do you want to speak to that? Sure. I think that's that's a common kind of you know concern that you're not going to see something happen that that first time or the second time. But I think you've got to understand the patients that you're seeing usually are quite severe already in their, you know, the severity of the MGD is quite bad. And so I, I get a lot of patients where I don't see anything at all happening the first time. I get a whole other group where you see terrific expressions the very first time. So there's a whole range of patient, you know, kind of um, presentations and, and you can't get discouraged by not seeing a perfect expression the first or even second time. You've got to keep at it a little bit. Okay, very good. And Dr. Odell, we did have a question come in also um, regarding when your presentation, the question was, uh, was your in-office uh, expression with Lipoflow, was it a manual? And I, and I guess the question is, was in-office expression with Lipoflow or, or manual. manual? Well, and I think yeah. that, yeah, so it was both because um, it was two different studies that we kind of went through. So one study was after Lipoflow taking home XL mask only. Um, and using that for 20 minutes a day post Lipoflow. And then the other study that um, we did was looking at um, after um, manual gland expression, which was done through warming the lids with the tranquil vibes in the office for 20 minutes. And then the patient was sent home either with um, the vibes or the XL. So the two studies, um, you know, aren't really you can't really compare the two studies because the first one we didn't have the uh, um, the vibes mask. Right. So the first the first one was um, lipoflow. Lipoflow. No then yeah. The yeah. So when I perform lipoflow, I normally don't do any manual gland expression afterwards. No. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And then um, there's another question. This is a, a good one for you, Dr. Dorn. Did you see in your follow-ups with um, in this protocol that you have with the manual gland expression, did you see any changes in prescription because of the improved um, acuity? Anybody having some real progress there after three months? There definitely were times where the prescriptions did change because we've improved the tear film and obviously the, the refractions did change slightly because now they had an improved tear film and subsequent improved refractions. So um, there are times when I have to do that. So um, I certainly have seen a lot of patients improve in their contact lens compliance as well. People that thought, you know, I just can't wear contacts anymore, um, certainly could wear contacts after we did gland expressions. 
Um, and that's certainly something that I, I do with a lot of my contact lens patients that complain. Even borderline dry eye with their contacts, we'll do some gland expressions and get them right back to wearing their contacts very comfortably. Terrific. Um, I think that the, you know, I, I do think just real quick, um, just from, you know, what I've, what I've done um, over the past several years is, um, you know, as we learn about MGD, we often do go to the very worst patient and think like, I can help them. I'm going to try this. You know, I'm definitely going to send them out for a gland treatment, whether it's, you know, now we have a, a lot of those in office procedures that we can choose from, but um when your glands are obstructed or you see a lot of atrophy, first of all, you know, we're already getting to the, we're late to the game, right? It's like sending the glaucoma surgeon the 0.9 cup. They'd rather see a patient earlier downstream of that disease. And that's what we need to keep doing is being proactive. But so um, I think a lot of doctors would get discouraged with whatever treatment they were electing because they thought one treatment was going to fix everything, right? Um, the science is there, even with technologies like thermal pulsation, which maybe isn't, you know, ideal to the patient financially. But um, if you had severe obstruction and the patient was put through um, three lipoflow procedures over the course of, I think the study was nine months. It, it was done by Arita, um, but the glands actually did perform, you know, and I've seen this with patients that I've been able to kind of put them through different um, heating treatments, um, just as new technologies were coming through the office. Um, so they weren't always having to pay, I could kind of see where I was going. What's nice about what Dr. Dorn's doing, it really makes me think of how I do things, you know, different, you know, how I'll do things differently moving forward is pre-treating ahead, right? So, sending them home with a better heat mask before they come back for any treatment and then already setting the platform for, you know, knowing when you're going to have to be doing more than one. And so I think that, you know, this allows us to do that a little bit easier because the financial, you know, burden to the patient is less. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, super. Uh, looks like we have time for one more, which is kind of in this whole um, this whole realm. And some uh, several people have asked. This seems to be something that could also be used um, prior to um, some kind of a, like a cataract surgery, prepping the the ocular surface prior to a surgical procedure to be able to have better outcomes. Dr. O'Dell, any comments? Oh, absolutely. On that? I mean, you. I actually would. I actually encourage um, doctors and do for myself. Um, to do a pre, um, you know, to do a pre cataract evaluation, whether, you know, I'm diagnosing and want to send out, I actually have them come back for a specific dry eye exam prior to, um, and the doctors, you know, are going to appreciate that because the more stable the tear film, the better the visual outcomes with these multifocal IOLs, you can't do enough ahead of time. Um, I think with using the, I, I'm just looking at one of the other questions. I think with using the heat, like Dr. Dorn is doing ahead of expression, you you are helping to change the quality of the mybum um, prior to your exam. And so that allows for, you know, a change in the consistency of that and hopefully a change in that melting point um, so that it kind of starts to thin the mybum ahead, making your expression easier. Um, and also, if you know you're going to be doing more than one expression, you don't have to be using force that's going to cause a lot of discomfort to the patient. So my concern for expression causing gland damage from how I do it, I, you know, I don't really have concern um, because I'm never, I'm never pressing to the point where the patient's like jumping out of the chair, you know, in, in pain. And I think that, you know, from what Dr. Dorn showed us in his video, and how he described how he does things, I would I, I would assume that that's the same that he's seeing. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you. I think you can you can really control that. You can watch what's happening behind the slit lamp. You kind of can gauge how the patient's feeling. My first expression, you know, it's the first time people are getting something like this done to their lids, so you have to be careful with that. You can use kind of more gentle pressure that first time, and then you can work up to that. And the second time, their expectation is kind of more normalized. They've had the first expression done. They're kind of prepared for what's going to happen there. And, you know, I can honestly say I, I really don't ever have patients that are really in pain per se. I think you kind of work up to a little bit more, you know, 
I guess, aggressive expression. Um, I want to make sure that I don't damage the glands at all. We're doing mybography all the time. We're watching those glands. Um, I'm not seeing any loss of that kind of tissue. So, um, you know, I think, I think the gland expressions actually tend to work very well in our office. Um, and Suzanne, I think you should just take this one last question too, before, um, while we still have some people, which is the question, about is tranquil vibes reusable um, because I think you do a good job explaining how that um, you know how many times can it be reused and how that would look yeah and by the way there are so many other questions we can't get to but all of them we will answer so you can um, you can also reach out to us directly at uh, sales at ieco.com and we'll if you but we'll we'll get back to everybody here but yes the everything we're doing is reusable so the tranquilize the kit that it comes with actually has a thousand um, it has seven gel packs, each gel pack, set of gel packs, each one has 150 treatments. So you get 1,000 heat treatments. It comes with the starters for liners and all kinds of good things. But everything we do is reusable so that it's practical in office, but also very practical for home use. Um, and so it's a, it's a good value, which is, which is super for everybody involved. And I know there was another, you know, there's so many questions. <laughs> all right, I know, it's 602. I don't know if we can keep going, but I'll, add, I'll do one more. As there was a question about whether or not he, the temperature was measured while we were doing in, in the study, what were we measuring uh, inner lid temperature? And I can let you ad address that, Dr. Dell. Yeah, unfortunately, no, I don't have access to being able to do that. Um, but utilizing some of that research, um, you know, with Caroline Blackie, looking at that 40 degrees Celsius sustained heat for 20 minutes, you know, um, it would be interesting to see, but I wasn't able to test that um, in this group. But you know, with that study, you can sort of deduce that hopefully we were making an impact on inner lid temperature. Um, I know Suzanne and I have talked about how easy it is to measure that inner lid temperature um, when we were planning this out, but we didn't have access to that. Yeah, and then there was there's a, another one, boy, all of it. Um, there were some thoughts, for Dr. Dorn, uh, are you doing mybography and using it as a guide for expression? Do you feel that the glands um, that appear absent are actually present, uh, but not, uh, sorry, but just not patent? Yeah, I think, you know, we're doing mybography on, on pretty much every patient because we're, we're developing a baseline before we start any treatments. So, you know, I think every MGD patient, I want to try to, even if there's a lot of drop out there, I want to maximize production from the glands that are there. So I want to start with the gland expression and, and try to get that going. You know, I'm just using anecdotal evidence that I, I see behind the slit lamp. You know, I think over time, it does seem to me that there's some expression that's coming from areas where it seems like there is no or there are no glands. Um, but that's just anecdotal. I'm just looking, you know, kind of at the edge of the, like, is the mybum coming out as a nice olive oil kind of liquid? And I, and I do see that happening. So I think just the overall, that over, overall treatment and doing that consistently on a regular basis does help with all the gland function. Super. Okay, with that, I want to thank everybody for your time and for attending. This will be, it is a recorded um, Session, so the recording will be available and I wish everybody well to stay happy and healthy and um, stay tuned for four. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thanks, Suzanne.